uh, Sarah Tukashinsky, and she is going to talk on the parameter space of bounding chains. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you <laughs> so I come from the A side. Uh, so if I might be using some, I don't know, pictures and short ones that I'm used to. If there is any question at any point, please feel free to uh, stop me and ask for definitions, details, whatever. Um, so I want to talk about, um, yes. Open run of Wittem invariance, minus zero only, um, about, um, about uh, their definitions and about their dependence on various choices. Um, on the start with settings, the symplectic manifold. I'll probably use n at some point. By that, I mean the complex dimension. Uh, almost complex structure living in the background. You're free to forget about it. It's uh, supposed to be same and uh, generic. Um, L, a Lagrangian submanifold. Um, submanifold. Uh, which I assume to be um, overflowed. I will assume connected, even though it's probably not not uh, necessary in a way. Um, oriented, which is also avoidable if you really want to, and relative spin, which in the non-oriented case uh, will be relative spin. But uh, you can just uh, forget uh, this is technicalities and they have some regularity assumptions. Yeah. Which are also, uh, which can also be worked around, but this is the basic universe. Okay, that's kind of works. Um, And 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 of course the basic question in, in open ground with theory is is the count of open curves. So maybe I'll just make a picture, um, which you all know probably, but I'll make it anyway. Um, okay. So if we have a space of um, D is a disk. Jalomorphic maps uh, from the disk with boundary conditions in Lagrangian. We want to fix the degree. Um, what else? Pretty much this. Um, divide by automorphism, compactify by adding stable curves. And the basic question is how many num how many elements are in this state? Um, and because um, and one way to maybe cut down the dimension when necessary is by adding constraints. So, uh, so constraints. Constraints. And um, I guess if you live on collabial free folds, then you don't care about constraints. But if you live in other places, then constraints are a feature, not a bug, uh, because they allow you, for example, to define an interesting quantum product. Uh, so that's fine. Um, and of course, um, whenever the moduli space has boundary, it becomes hard to count things invariantly. So the problem is um, the space may very much 
have boundary um, and when you have, I guess, let's say this is a schematic picture of M and I want to say count um, this curve and it looks like some this, but maybe it has some constraints on it, I don't know. Um, and I want to change my data. For example, I want to change the complex structure. Then my point will start moving in the space. And um, well, as long as it's moving within the space, I have no problem, I can still count it. But if I reach the boundary, um, then when I keep changing my complex structure, I will sort of flip out of the space. Um, over here, I have nothing to count. I'm outside of my space. So uh, one example uh, that illustrates it is the space of disks with one boundary condition, I'll call it point zero, two uh, interior constraints, one at point one, one at point two. These are not complex points, these are just the labels of the point. Um, so I'm thinking here, and it's zero, just so it's easier for me to, to draw. And it's zero, and of course, supportingly, the degree zero. Um, we can check that the dimension of the space of this thing then is uh, two, and it looks as follows. So uh, here is the inside, there is the open stratum, and that's where proper disks uh, with marked points like that live. And then we have two boundary components. One is when point two uh, bubbles off to the boundary, and we get one disk with point two, and the not node, the real node, with a disk in point one and point zero. And the uh, second option is that point one bubbles at the boundary, and we get one disk with point one, one disk with point two, and zero. Um, and you'll note I also have corners here. This corner comes from this picture when now point, um, yes, when point zero uh, goes to the boundary, we get this. One, two, and this corner comes from uh, when zero goes to the node from the other side. That's two, zero, one. And because the order of points on the boundary is, is well, it matters, right? The points in the interior, well, it's a two dimensional space, they can move around as they please, but the boundary is one dimensional. So this order and that order are truly different. And so these are different strata in the moduli space. Um, and this is a description of this particular moduli space. And as you see, it does have a boundary. And the moral of that is, is exemplifying one type of boundary and that type of boundary is, uh, comes from disk bubbling. So here in this picture, it would be uh, as if when I got to this point of the boundary, the configuration I get is this nice disk, let's say of size beta, splitting into smaller disk. This one of degree beta prime, say, and this one of degree beta, beta double prime. And the solution to this kind of problem, um, or the tool by which we fix this kind of problem is a bounding chain. Now I will say more about bounding chains in the, in the second half of my talk. Um, yep. But just to get the picture, it says the following thing. It says, well, true, at this point in time, I have those two disks and then they no longer belong in any way to this moduli space, but I can look at this configuration as coming from the splitting of a big disk, but I can also look at this configuration as having two little disks that happen to collide. So each of them 
I want to consider, you know, each of them has a life of its own, right? So actually, um, somewhere out there, there is a space of a little disk that looks like beta prime, and it lives inside of its own sort of modulate space M prime. And there's also the space of little disks that looks like uh, of degree beta double prime lives inside its own modulate space. And the idea here is that, okay, I need to count not just these big disks. Let's say I want to count curves of degree beta. I need to count not only curves of genuine degree beta, but also collections of sort of disconnected collections of disks uh, of degrees that sum up to beta. And that together satisfy whatever constraints I'm holding. Now, I might not want to count all possible collections. That would be too much. So I have a gadget that tells me which collections actually end up colliding and contributing to my count. That, that, that gadget is exactly the bounding chain or uh, in its more common way in literature is a weakly bounding co-chain, which is longer and I'm too lazy to say this. So I just keep calling it a bounding chain. Um, but um, yes, it's very much a co-chain because we work in the DRAM model um, and so on. But, and I will hopefully give a more precise definition, uh, but if it's not too urgent, then we can maybe talk first about the second type of boundary. Let's see if I can manage as well with them. To exemplify the second type of boundary, I will use another example. I will use a, a slight modification of the above example. I'll just forget the boundary point. So that will be example two. Um, okay, if I have one less marked point in the boundary, then the dimension of the modulate space will be one less than the dimension there because I have one less degree of freedom. So it's going to be one dimension. And it will have two boundary components, one coming, from well, one of the marked points going to the boundary, and this results in um, this bubbling here. One is point one, and one of this point two at the other disk. And well, what's the other boundary component you ask? Is when the boundary of the disk collapses to a point. So we get a sphere with points one and two on it. Um, and this is a description of this modular space. And the moral of this picture is we have a second type of boundary components is um, boundary degeneration. And the solution or the tool we use to solve this problem is a cone complex, is an appropriate cone complex. And here I do want to tell you a little bit more in detail because this is a one tool and you have no point. Um, so let me detail a little bit about this thing. Let's say I denote by A differential forms, smooth differential forms. I know you might like omega. I like to keep omega for harmonics. And um, 
the map into, let's say, the ground ring. So it's going to be a magical ring, but it's, it's an algebra over R, R the reals. Uh, by a map that I uh, denote by I underscore, it takes a form and it integrates it over my Lagrangian. So you restrict the form, and then you take the integral. And the cone of this map is what I want to take. And you may ask why. And I will tell you because it works. And hopefully I'll make some pictures that will try to convince you that it works. And uh, but let's first let me write down the cone. Is then is literally the cone of this map. So the, as, as the complex, the chain complex looks like this form of X, direct sum. Well, the map itself reduces degree by M because it's integral over L. And then for the cone, we shift degree further. So it's so leave. And the boundary of the cone, if I take a pair, let's say eta comma A, eta is a form in X, A is some constant. Right, I think of, of R as a chain complex where all the all the chains live in degree M. Um, constant, and then B of cone is just B of eta. Um, uh, you apply the math to eta, and then re remove the B of A. But well, B here is just zero. So literally, it's just B of eta and then I of eta. In other words, just the integral of eta over L. Which is funny. You would think this makes no sense. The boundary doesn't even care what happens in the second component. Why would you want that? And I would say, I hear you. I didn't think that would work either. Um, can't help it. Math told us to, so that's what we did. You got to do it the way it says. Um, yeah, no, I, I, in case you were wondering, this is a foreign language, so we need to speak, uh, um, right. Um, so why is this poem so nice? Because this is exactly actually the way I can, so we haven't raised it. One way of thinking of this picture here. We said one way of thinking of this picture here is that it splits from one big disk, or we can think of it as two little disks colliding. Same way here, we have two ways of interpreting this picture. You could think, well, this is a disk where the boundary degenerated to a point, or you could think, well, this is a sphere that descended to intersect the Lagrangian. Uh, not descended because that has a mathematical meaning, but it's just a sphere that happened to intersect the Lagrangian at a point. Um, so a way to fix this contribution is to say, okay, so now we don't only um, count disks, but we also want to incorporate certain type of spheres, those that have the potential as a two-dimensional one phenomenon to uh, intersect Lagrangian. And this is what the cone allows us to do. We have are, are those spheres live here. And here we can plug in whatever data we want. In particular, we can plug here a count of disk, for example. And what the boundary do, will do is it uh, mixes those contributions. It puts some contributions of spheres into the second component. And let me do a picture sort of proof of a statement. And like all picture proofs is going to be a little bit annoying, but we can do this, I think. 
Um, so, for example, um, patient. This particular cone is the relative potential. Um, I guess I need to mention it is defined by Jake Solomon and myself at some point. Um, so psi is going to be an element in in this cone for the sake of argument, which means it has two components. One is a chain in X, and one is a number. And that number is going to be just the count of all disks. All possible disks of all possible degrees with all possible constraints. And the chain in X is going to be the chain uh, defined by all possible spheres of all possible degrees with all possible constraints. So if uh, capital phi, say, is the closed from within potential, this is going to be like the gradient of phi. Okay, like if you pair this chair, chain, if you pair this chain with some constraint in X, you get the Brom with an invariant that involves that constraint. Okay? Questions about the picture? No, that is a beautifully rigorously defined size. Wonderful. Uh, unless you're just too shocked to formulate the question, also not. No. Okay. Maybe I have a quick question. Yes, so uh, in the beginning you said L is connected, is that correct? Or I did, yes. Um I do not know that we explicitly use it at any point. I am pretty sure that you don't have to assume that. Um, I mean, but because then you could integrate all right? L with is connected, you could have several such evaluation marks. To uh, integrate against each connected component. Right, so if L is disconnected, there are several ways of thinking of it. You can think of it all as L and then take this L and integrate over the entire thing. Or you can treat each component separately and do sort of open ground with the theory for that alone and take sort of the direct sum of all of them. I did not try to see what this gets. I assume it works just fine, but I did not try. Yeah, so for me, L is connected because that's the thing that we wrote down and that's what I know. But uh, yes, absolutely. Like one interesting example would be to take, say, two circles on a sphere, and you want presumably um, so the honest answer is I'm not sure. I assume that this works fine. The way personally I would like to do this is to actually do think of each component as a separate thing, and then this one will have its own bounding chain, and this one will have its own bounding chain, and then they sort of. Uh, and because it's disconnected, the disk li li disks live either here or there. Uh, but you can use your exterior for both. Uh, but I don't know. My claim is that, first of all, uh, this thing is closed in the phone complex. I'm not going to prove it because it's a fact of life. And secondly, because it did write you a proper definition. But let's say D cone of psi is actually zero. And then the claim, the next claim is um, this class is invariant under which is the relevant. Uh, Isotopy, which is the relevant equivalence condition here. It's um, it's how we define the age equivalence for uh, for bounding chain. Um, and this claim, I can sort of draw you a picture of how to prove it, and hopefully this picture will illustrate why this cone is a good choice. Uh, but moreover, what I essentially claim is that this is sort of the true invariant. Um, if you project it to the first component, you recover all of closed ground with the theory. Uh, if you project it to the second component, you need to be careful in doing that because just projection is usually not that chain map, but you have a way of doing that. 
um, the way you fix it to become a chain map is exactly by incorporating some contributions from your first two columns. That recovers you the open gram of witness theory. So this is sort of the full true uh, invariant for genus zero gram of witness theory, closed and open, uh, combined, and um, and you can recover everything else from it. And maybe maybe I can really put try to draw a picture for why it's true. Let's say I have um, Let's say I have an isotopy in time zero, I have psi in time one. Let's say I varied the couple of structure, I get some psi prime. And in between, I have the isotopy, so there is like a psi kill living in between them. Yeah, that's kind of gross. Okay. Uh, so I want to say that psi prime minus psi is exact in this cone form in the cohomology of this cone complex. That would mean that the, the class defined by psi prime is the same as the class defined by psi, and we, we're a bit. Uh, well, psi prime is what happens at time one. This is what happens at time zero. So Stokes theorem says, well, just this is the integral from zero to one of um, of what? Now it will be. Um, we'll be confused for sure. <laughs> yes, yes, that's the problem. Um, uh, hi, sorry, what is what? Um, in a way, in a way, yes. Um, yes, in a way. Um, you know what? Let me do this maybe. I think they do want to put a side prime there, but I think I'm going to do this. So maybe um yes I mean okay so for the sake of, of, of saving time, I will not maybe press this group, but rather I will give you a different use that maybe will be more interesting for parts of the, of the audience because let's say you can believe me that this thing is invariant, uh, right? Like why would you believe it is because of the way the phone works, but maybe a better application, which will be in this application too, is the relative quantum homology. Um, and that's, that's, that's the following. So this, the cohomology of this cone, like we said, it projects to the cohomology of X. Uh, cohomology of X maps by integration over L, which is like this I into the R coefficient ring and on chain, on chain level, this would be uh, a short exact sequence, and so we get a long exact sequence of complexes. And basically, what I want to say is that I define this corner of a triangle to be the relative quantum homology. I lie a little bit, but just a tad. Um, of course, as a module, we all know this is exactly the closed quantum homology. And the beauty of this triangle is we can define a quantum product on this, this thing that involves closed ground with invariance and open ground with invariance because, hey, it comes from the phone. Um, so that this, this thing is, is, is now, um, th this morphism respect the product. So,
and it's not even very mysterious either because well there are two ways really this thing can go right either l is homologically trivial in which case integrating any closed class will be zero on it so this arrow is zero and you get a, a short exact sequence r to relative homology to absolute homology or L is homologically non-zero, in which case integration over L is surjective on homology. And then you get a different, then this arrow is zero, and you get a different short exact sequence relative to absolute to R. So either, either, Either relative form homology is a ring one extension of the absolute one, or it's a subalgebra. Let me give you an explicit example, maybe. And for that, I will need my notes because I don't remember numbers or formula or anything. Um, if X and L is CPN with RPN in it, and I assume N is odd because I assume that my Lagrangian is oriented, there's some work in progress to define the stuff for non-oriented Lagrangian by Oliver Hood from the degree of the grad student. Uh, but for now, I need it to be oriented, so N is odd. And then you will not be happy to find that I add a sign that you didn't expect because I twist the close potential. And also I will write the quantum scalar with a half power because it works nicer that way. So I claim for me, this is the close quantum cohomology of CPN. And the relative form, well, RPN for R odd that lives in a in, in zero in, in the ring zero in well it's also ring zero is everything. So in the ring zero, uh, right? Because odd homology of X is zero. So we're in the first case, so we expect a rank one extension, and we get indeed PM relative to RPN. Um again it's R. With this g to the half. And now we'll have two variables, let's call them x and y. And we divide by, um, so this relation of generalizers to x to the n plus one minus n plus one over two q minus n minus one over two times half times q to the half y. And then, we have y squared minus two q to the half y, and then we have x y. These are the relations. And the, of course, we also have a map here. So this is the thing we call A. This can also map here via A by sending y zero, q to the half, q to the half, and x. Very explicit and and as soon as we, and, and really doesn't take much to compute. So right, the the, the the only thing we needed we know we know we need to add someone called y, and the way we figure out the relations is we have to compute uh, the closed and open global with invariance. And the last remark I want to make about this, how much time I have asked? That's 10 minutes, right? That's not much. Um last remark I want to make about this is um so we have this bounding chain and we have this phone complex and the whole thing sounds kind of abstract and, and useless but as you see we can actually compute some things we can actually compute invariants also in some examples so there are computations for cpn with rpn as a lagrangian with there's a recent uh preprint online by 
a bunch of people. Uh, Bella, Fu, and Solomon, who computed the invariance for the Chiang Lagrangian in CP3, which is surprisingly interesting. Um, it's also the first computation I'm aware of where the Lagrangian is not the fixed focus of an anti symplectic involution. Uh, there is a paper in preparation by Hudson, Solomon, and myself where we compute relative homology for n open convert invariance for complete intersections. So there are explicit examples. They are not that hard to produce. The hardest thing about these computations usually seems to be um, computing the signs of initial values. As you see, they are highly non-trivial signs. Um, so eventually we end up doing like classical algebraic geometry. Um, and finally, I want to say, though, um, at the very least, our construction depends on a bound name torch. It secretly depends on another choice that I didn't tell you. Uh, but it primarily depends, or at least you already know it depends on the choice of a bounding chain. Bounding chain was the recipe that tells me which little disks I need to count together in order to get an invariant. Um, right, so. Be more than the chain. So these open ground with invariants we get depend on the choice of the dominant chain. So to get canonical. values of OGW, whatever canonical needs to mean, is the same as having a canonical choice of the bounding chain. We need a canonical Uh, but that means that we need to understand the space of all possible bounding chains in order to say, oh, this one is the canonical one. Um, and this is actually from a paper back in my thing. So for any one, one example. Uh, well, the first R5 version, I guess, made it, the first version made it to R5 in play. Um, is, let's say, let's say, L is a rational homology sphere. Then equivalent classes of bounding chains are characterized by the value integral of b over l. So a bounding chain, I did not tell you this at any point, but a bounding chain is serving as a, as a chain on l. And it's not closed. It's not closed. It's really a chain. It's not a class. Important. Uh, but I can still integrate it. And the statement is, well, if l has only essentially homology in top degree and zero, well, zero is not interesting in top degree, then the integral of a form on L, well, well, then two chains are equivalent if and only if their integrals are the same. So basically, if their point part is the same. Um, and you might say, well, okay, that's not, it's, it's nice. 
it allows us to have a canonical notion of open ground with invariance every time L is a sphere, which is a lot of times like RPM over R is a sphere and so on and so forth. Um, quadrants, quadrant hypersurfaces, right? Uh, the, the real local to the sphere and so on. So it's nice, we can do computations with it. Like I mentioned, we did computations with it. Good. But uh, you may argue this is the reason why this happens. And, and I would argue that no, this is not the reason. And I don't have very much time to, but I will. Um, let's say this is not an archive, so I'll put a question mark. Hopefully, this will be out still in 2023. We never know. Um, let's say L is homologically trivial, and the restriction map is surjective. Again, I only care about three coefficients because differential forms are magic. If the restriction is subjective, then we'll see. Um, equivalence classes of bounding chains. Our class are characterized by a slightly more complicated value. So let's say um, theta j are forms in X that are in fact closed, so that they generate all of the elemology. Want to say R? And G of L up to top degree of the basis. Then I can take a fancy expression and pair it with those thetas, thetas, sorry, and I get a list of parameters. I get a list of parameters. Um, the length of the list is exactly as the dimension of homology lower than top degree of L. So, for example, if a special case where L, where L is homologically sphere, then we only have one, then the list is of length one. It has only contributions coming from degree zero. And then this expression also specializes to just integral of three. Uh, but I have the point is I have an explicit expression that says exactly. Uh, how many parameters determine the class of a bounding cochain. And it seems that as long as the homology of L is a little bit more complicated than just degree zero than M, I should be getting more parameters. And I am getting more parameters and um, to classify equivalent classes of bounding chains. And then you say, well, okay, then maybe if there you had one chain to pick because you only had one parameter here well you have all those many parameters either you need to pick your favorite value of the parameters or um maybe you don't have a canonical choice maybe there are different ways my claim is that you still have a canonical choice and the reason has absolutely nothing to do uh with all those extra dimensions i don't actually care about all those extra dimensions uh, for the purpose of Gromov witness theory. I will care about them very much for the purposes of, say, studying the Fukaya category, because each of those choices would be a different element in the Fukaya category. But for Gromov witness theory, I have the following, I know, I'm almost done. I have the following surprising fact. Uh, let's say, Omega is the open world version super potential. So it's a generating function. So there's some combinatorial coefficients in them. Gromov with invariance is a generating function for Gromov with invariance. Um, I can write it as the sum of all this with a bunch of constraints in this bounding code chain. And then maybe a bunch of constraints in the interior as well. I don't mind. Um, so let's say these are k, k greater or equal than one. And then 
another term that comes from no boundary constraints. And this contribution comes from either disks with no boundary points on them or spheres will be incorporated using the code. Beautiful. Point is, if uh, let's say the integral of B over L is, I don't know. Um, point is, whenever I take a parameter, it doesn't matter really. Um, which some 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 formal parameter, right? This B has formal variables in it. The interior constraints may have a formal variable in it, and so on and so forth. So if if B lives in some algebra over R that has this formal variable in it, and maybe other stuff as well, I take the derivative of this with respect to B. Um, it's a fact of life that we get some constant times. It's not a hard fact of life because I'm out of time anyway. But my point is you have a relation that says, well, if you take a parameter that's, that's visible in a boundary constraint and you try to see all the invariants that have this parameter in them, you only get something non-zero if that parameter plays a role in the top degree of B. Which means no matter how many degrees I have there in the classifying space, the only one that really matters is the one associated to the top degree of B. And therefore, no matter how complicated the space of bounding code chains is, as long as they have an untrivial parameter corresponding to this, this would be the one canonical choice of, a, of, a, of an equivalent stuff for bounding chains that I'm going to use to define my invariant. And I'm over time for the for that. Well, thank you very much. We still have time for questions. So maybe I missed the, but did you write the relation between omega and psi? Um, I didn't explicitly know, but omega is going to be, let's say, a projection of psi. It's, it's a correction of just projecting psi to the second component. You need to correct it by adding stuff from the, from the first component. So would you like Elaborate enough, or? No, no. So it is because you said psi are all the invariants, and then right. So psi. So it has this e, which is the corrections from the first component. Uh, it's it has it has corrections from the from actually from both components because the second component also has just two just no boundary constraints on them, but it also has contributions coming from the first component of psi. Yeah, but the first component only contributes to e. Right. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. First component only contributes to. E. Oh, um, quick question. So at some point you mentioned um, a construction involving Lagrangians that were not the fixed point locus of an anti-symplectic involution. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, what was that construction? So this construction is symplectic. We don't care about any presence of an anti-symplectic involution at all. But the specific example that I mentioned uh, was the Chiang Lagrangian. I can maybe put the... It's a cute construction. We know it's an, we know it's Lagrangian because it's by definition the the, the fiber of a moment top. Um, but to show that it is not the fixed locus of any anti-symplectic involution is 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 an untrivial statement. Um, so we identify CP three with a third symmetric product of CP one uh, inside of CP one. We take uh, inside of this product, you take uh, all those triples that add to zero. Right, so a, a way to think of it is, is you have um, unordered triples of points that make an equilateral triangle doesn't look at the real so I don't know how to draw a picture. But um, maybe like this is better. Something like that. Equilateral triangles on a circle in size 51. And so so you could define this basically to be your moment map. So this is just the zero fiber. And so this is a Lagrangian submanifold and uh, by defined by River Chiang for entirely different purposes. And it's a, it's an interesting example for different things. Um, it's um, 
it's actually a sphere. It's not just it has a homogeneous sphere, but it's actually a sphere. It's a homeomorphic sphere. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. And it is known to not be the six locus of any any entity that's That's yeah, sorry. That was about, but that's not, that's covered by the theorem from. That the is 16th. covered by the theorem. Yes, I mentioned it as an example of a case where invariants have been computed yeah, 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 yeah. using our definition. Yes, and also the small quantum part, quantum, the ring structure of the small quantum part. And so, so, so the independence of this omega on the other parameters, I mean, that's a consequence of this bounding chain quantum. It's a because consequence. It's closed or something. It comes uh, from the Mara Katana equation at the end of the day. It's, uh, well, it's used eventually, but yes, let me maybe just, well, because you know the notation, so I can very quickly show you the computation. It just looks like one over k plus one mk b to the k times b, and then those e corrections that are not dependent on s at all. That's a separate thing. It's not, it's not, well, it's not easy. Um, and you have the S of all this. So by symmetry, it doesn't matter which input you, you take the derivative of, you just go over the symmetry here and you get mk b to the k times the derivative. And here, yes, Mora Cartan says this is something times unit. So this is just this. And you can take the derivative outside and so only one parameter essentially. Okay, yeah. Other question? Yeah. So, with your parameter space for your bonding chains, do they not depend on the fiber uh, base, on the base point, or how is the dependence? That's a good question. Let me let me see if I understood you correctly. If I have a family, right, of like, like fibers of, of a state, particularly as with vibrations, does the space of all bounding co chains depend on the fiber? Yes. Or very, how does it vary with the fiber? Um, I did not think of it. It's a good question. I would hope it doesn't, but I don't know. I don't know. It's a good question. I thought you didn't need it. I mean, I thought the fiber was not obstructed. You didn't need it. Well, I mean, Again, it's 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 um the bounding coaching for me is a feature of the bounding. So maybe even if M0 is already zero, I might want to add a bounding chain, for example, in order to introduce boundary constraints. Um like zero is here's the thing. Zero is canonical. <laughs> that depends on what you're trying to do. Like for example, if I do want boundary constraints, zero can be um, there can be a bounding domain, like say, even like two to three, right? Yes, um, you can take zero, but I don't want to take zero at first to the point because I want to be able to have point to strain on my down. If you don't need to correct any bubbling, if you create all the obstruction vanish from symmetry, so you could take zero, but I don't want it. For me, a point is more canonical than, than zero. Other questions? I don't see any other questions. So let us thank our speaker one more time. And I believe we have another coffee break.